Uh, my name is Amy Nolte, and I, I do so want to talk to y'all about some, some lovely cards. How to play all these interconnected notes that are just lovely, and I have no idea what I'm doing, but it's so subtle. Now, sorry, Amy, I actually really enjoy your videos. I have no idea what you're doing most of the time, but that's purely on me because I, I don't have the, the background in, in musical theory, but I watch them, and you know what? I still learn. The way that I learn is the way that is, is part of a message that I want to give people very quickly is that you can actually learn a surprising amount without actually knowing that you're learning. It may not be the very best way of doing it, but it actually works. If you give yourself a good grounding in some basics, then you can find that your brain and body can put some things together. So I will watch people like Amy Nolte, who obviously knows what she's doing, which is... Well, it's fucking jazz. I don't really know what she's doing, but by watching it, letting it seep in, it actually starts to reappear when my brain works out how to put it together. So forgive me there for uh, paying out on you, Amy. I actually really like your stuff. Um, just wanted to do something different. Today, I'm starting a new series, and this series is on tone. Transition of tone. So we can look at all of the aspects of tone when it comes to making music. Now, I ain't Amy, so I'm not going to fuss too much on how to put together our lovely chords and string them out and turn them into that. I'm going to talk about it from the way that I deal with music, which is to look at, well, how does tone apply to the instruments that we use, the way that we mix them? So I'll be covering subjects like filtering, equalization, mixing, all with regards to tone. But before we do that, something I just want to run by you quickly. Obviously, there's a time sensitive issue. So if you've come to this video a little bit later in life, oh, let's just turn this off. Time sensitive issue. Over the next couple of days, you have the opportunity to get my Indie Musicians Guidebook for a significant price reduction. It's all here in the little picture on May the 6th from 8 a.m. PDT. Uh, it's at $5.99. It's normally $19.95, $5.99. 70% saving, boys and girls. If you are not super quick, because fortune favours the bold, if you are not super quick, then from the 7th of May, it moves to $10.99, which is still basically half price, 45% off. And then if you are a slug, a sloth, a sloth, a lazy person, whatever, you do not want to be favoured by fortune, you, then it'll go back up to its normal $19.95, which is well and truly worth it. Well and truly worth it. There's a huge amount of information in here. That's all available on my website. Links in the down here. So if you're all interested and like the way that I present stuff, there's a whole book on it. Enough. Back to tone. So the very first thing is to look at what is tone. I'm going very big picture here on what tone is. If we were to step right outside, and this is almost becoming metaphysical, but the two go together, and please do not skip on this, because then you'll wonder why you have troubles later. And every, every time I slow down to try and teach you all something, it is about me trying to give you the real background so that you do better. When I was a kid, my father, highly, highly trained classical musician, cathedral organist, harpsichordist, choir master, Guildhall London, I mean, this is like the top school. Uh, and his view on, on teaching kids, because he did a lot of teaching, on teaching kids how to do music, was very much you get it right from the first time. Because he said, if you don't get it right at the beginning, then you develop these bad habits that you then end up saying, but that's my style, man. And the number of times I've heard that from people who can't sing or can't get their stuff out right. And I'm no 
pedantic person, despite how it appears, with regards to particularly singing. I mean, God, if you go and like, listen to my singing, it was um, loose. But if you don't get the reasons why at the beginning, or don't put them in your brain at least, then you'll develop these bad habits that you'll never quite overcome. And that's, that's a horrible, horrible thing. You know, you don't want to be at my age and watching Amy Nolte videos and going, I have no idea what the hell she's doing. But you can get over that, I think. So, tone. On one scale, on the big metaphysical scale, scale we can start with nothing. In terms of music, nothing is silence. A complete absence of any sound. If you've ever been into a true vocal booth in a true studio, the first thing you probably did was freak out. Start to feel dizzy. Think you're maybe going to throw up, pass out. Because it's a complete anechoic chamber with nothing coming in from the outside world, you're in complete silence. Is not a comfortable place for anyone to be, especially somebody who is very keyed to sound. So those physical reactions are actually quite normal when people first go into a vocal booth. It's like, oh, oh, couldn't get out fast enough. So if you've never done it, please try and find the opportunity to do it. Go into a studio and go into uh, an actual real vocal booth, not some, some little you know, TARDIS that somebody put in their corner with, with blankies or something. Um, complete silence. And I know as a, lot, a lot of times as musicians, we're terrified of com complete silence, where we'll be playing stuff. Ooh. And we're afraid of silence. But silence is a component of what we build. Sand shapes silence. Silence shapes sound, which comes first, good or evil, dark or light. Don't care, it's all the same. So on one side we have silence, and on the other side we have everything, all sound. Now all sound in recording, especially in the electronic music world, is generally referred to as white noise. If we were a painter and we were playing with Hello. An absence of anything is black. All colours on our little pinwheel spin our little pinwheel of all, all the, the rainbow of colours and they go white. So that's everything at once. White noise. So very simply, our scale, our transition of tone goes from goes from nothing to everything, or mellow to bright, dark to light, thin to thick, low to high. Now we're going to investigate all these things over the course of this series, and more importantly, how they can be used by you as the musician and or recording guy, girl. But really think in terms very carefully of what this really means to you. You've got to grok this concept. You've got to really get this concept. So um, the other way that we can do that is to have white noise and open a filter. Nothing. Silence. We can see the sound there, but we can barely hear it because it's really low. And just like my lovely picture looks like a wave, you hear how this sounds like a wave. You hear how that is the sonic equivalent of my gorgeous picture. I deliberately drew it that way because that's kind of how it, it looks. It helps you to understand that, that we go from absolutely nothing to absolutely everything all at once. And you know what happens if you encounter absolutely everything at once? You go mad as well. 
Uh, I can't remember who first said it. it, might have been John in the Bible or something or other, but the, the old adage of to see the, but the face of God is to go mad. Those people who see the whole universe at once go crazy. We don't like a huge amount of noise all at once. It makes us go crazy. So see on both sides of your scale there, complete silence. It's very hard to do this backwards. Complete silence is unsettling. A total bandwidth of noise, just noise, is equally distressing. As musicians, our job is to balance tone over time. See, music is a transition of tone, so there's tone and time, which is part of what the wave tries to express, tone moving through time and the amount thereof. Really take your time to understand this, and I hope you're not skipping on this. So, how might we express that? If I really were any, I'd be playing my piano. That's a low note. That's a high note. So we've got low and high. We express our music in a transition. From low to high, and from high to low. A melody that does this is not actually a melody. And I know Trailer Swift and all her fans want to tell us otherwise, but screw you. You don't know what you're talking about. Your music will be gone in about five minutes. This is not a melody and never will be. There are a few times where you can use that as an effect. But if that's all you ever do, you got nothing. It needs to be. There we are using tone and time. There's space between the notes to help define them. There are notes to help define the space. Tone moves. In this case, you might think it's only pitch that's moving, but tone moves as well, move that a little bit more as we go on. But if we just sit here and do this, somewhere a few seconds ago, you probably would have gone, Benedict, that's fucking boring. And you're right, I hope you did think that. That's why. Is necessary. So we've got a call and response. But even if we just keep doing that, it's only a matter of time before you start to say, Benedict, that's fucking boring. And you're right. So we have to call and respond. That's using tone and time. And then we need to make it do something else. It bears a relationship. Maybe not the best relationship, <laughs> and you probably don't know what you're doing. But it's not about my music playing skills. It's about that idea that tone and time always have to work together, but they can't be the same. If they're the same, there's no purpose to them. If I say to you, see that little black dot up there? Stare at it for 10 minutes. Okay, maybe you're going to have some kind of amazing spiritual experience. Don't let me hold you back. I mean, really, don't let me hold you back. But chances are you're going to get bored and walk away. Go eat some jelly beans or something or other. That's what I'd do. Probably eat cheese. There has to be movement. Out of all that movement, you notice we're going up, we're transitioning low to high, and high to low. 
as we get better at music. We can do the both at once. That bit becomes two layers of tone and time because we've got, which is one thing, and the other. Whack the two together. And we get something that, well, should be music. <laughs> it would be if I could play properly. But again, you're not here to judge my playing to judge the ideas. So I put the thinking guy on the beginning of my videos. What you're hearing there is a progression of silence to lots. It's expressionistic, isn't it? What we're seeing there is a combination of juxtaposition, juxtaposition of silence, which we tend to ignore. And we tend to go, oh, well, there's nothing happening there. So if I go, most of us will actually end up going, we played a note and like that. We don't actually say he hit a note, he played silence. Insane gave us a bit more silence and then hit another note. When in actual fact, that's what really happened. So don't ignore silence. So I'm juxtaposing in my expressionistic expression silence with sound, mellow with bright, dark with light, definitely thick and thin. That's thin. That's thick. We've got to balance those two. There's been a tremendous, awful habit in the last so many years of just making everything thick all the time. All we ever hear in music is thick. So you go straight from nothing. <laughs> And then it just goes even thicker and thicker and thicker. And, and it's not to say this, that, that it can't be like that. That can have its merits. It definitely can. But if you sit and listen to Metallica's Black Album from Go To Woe, you're probably feeling a bit over it by halfway through because it's just thick, 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 thick. Interestingly enough, you do the same with Justice, which see, feels like a longer record. And yet it's far easier to go through the whole record because there's actually more movement in that record. Odd. So pianos. Pianos are useful because you can do terrible things like play. actually works. Oh, I'm so creative. So with synthesizer, sounds like shit, as we're about to discover. Oops, better when I choose the right instrument. Okay, if, if that's my symphony of cars stuck on the freeway, then maybe I can get away with that. But it doesn't really doesn't sound that good. But pianos are, are a wonderful instrument in the sense that they actually allow us to do these things. It's, it's a bit harder to do with other instruments. So let's kill our pianonator because we don't really need him anymore. Thank you, music. You're good. Cool. But now let's look at this. In recording, we see the core of everything that we do as being a sine wave. Now, I've gone through waveforms before, so this isn't really discussing waveforms, but we'll take a quick 
meander through that because some of you may not have been watching fast. But you can go back and watch the whole series of videos on waveforms. So that's our, our core. In this case, we're playing it low or we're playing it high. That you may say, well, it's pitch. But remember, I'm rolling tone, pitch into the same thing. So if, we're th if you're thinking tone as being purely timbre, I'm rolling the two together. Pitch and timbre, same, 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 same ball of wax. Because if you ask a person to describe that sound, they'll probably say it's bright. It's not a bright sound. Not at all. It's just a thin, high-pitched sound. So broadly, yeah. Low to high. Thin to thick. That actually sounds thin. That sounds thick. Even though it seems upside down from pitch, that's why I'm putting the two together and giving you several things to, in, to, to consider in terms of transition and tone. So that's, that's the beginning thing that we tend to think of in synthesis and recording. Everything is with reference to a sine wave. Probably should be with reference to nothing, to silence, but it's with reference to a sine wave. Don't fuss too much on it, but that's the basic thing that, that we think. It's the, the empty tone that doesn't have anything else. We then start to complexificate it by adding in overtones. So that's us moving along this scale here between not much of and everything at once. We've just added more overtones. More overtones again. Whoops. Even more. And back to white noise, which is the whole damn lot all at once. So that's us moving through that wave of nothing to not very much to every damn thing in the universe at once. Really important to take your time to get your head around that. So if we were to look at a phase modulation oscillator, this does this very nicely. It goes from actually where I learned my synthesis on a Casio CZ. So it's, it's part of why this was in part endemic to me to understand it this way. Without a filter, we've got... Up here it sounds bright. It also sounds thin. And as you see in my little infographic, bright and thin are actually on opposite sides. Why does it sound bright up here? It sounds thin up here. Why does it sound low in tone or low in pitch? But bright because it's got that on top, the buzz on top. But somehow it sounds thick down here. The answer is surprisingly simple, and this is why we tend to try and make our music bass heavy. We tend to pitch everything below middle C. Somebody said to me in the early days when I was composing, listen to some of my music, and he said, I don't think you ever play any notes above middle C. And I was like, yeah, they don't sound any good. <laughs> what a dick. <laughs> really, what a fool. They don't sound any good. <laughs> but there was a reason for that. A low note, when you play, you can see all these overtones which means they're easier to hear. Our fundamental is way down here, and it's easier for the brain to hear all those overtones. When it's played up here, it's not actually as easy to hear all those overtones, because they're getting up into the point where we don't hear them anymore. Not consciously, anyway. So the difference 
once we get right up into territory and territory is there's not an awful lot of difference between a violinist who's up on the pit guard, assuming he has one on a fiddle, and Van Halen or Malmsteen when he's up on the pit guard. You can't hear a lot of difference. And yet, if we have the same player right down on right out on the end of his neck, let's get with his fiddle and his guitar, they're radically different instruments. You'd say, oh, gee, they're not the same instrument at all. And yet you'll, you get them up into the pointy end and they sound the same. So it's entirely possible to be high and thin at the same time. Please don't make the mistake I used to make of saying I'm oh, only going to use notes below middle C because they're the only ones that sound any good. <laughs> it's just a really stupid way to do it. Thankfully, I got over it. So we transition in lots of different axes at once, which is a big part of what I'm trying to get across. It's You can't draw this. So this is why you see I'm swinging my hands around. We've got one axis or metric and then we've got another one and they seem to contradict each other and that's a point where it's easy for you to say fuck this is all a pile of shit these guys don't know what the fuck they're talking about but actually they do it's just you haven't realized that we're working on at least a 3d model if not a 4d or a 5d model i'm, I'm not going to argue that some other info expert can do that not really very interested but understand that things can be several things at once, or one thing in one situation and something else in another. When you listen to, to Slash standing on, on the piano in November Rain, boy, is that a thick performance. But he's also at times up against the pick guard, playing thin notes, and the fiddle players are up here. And... You know what? The fiddle players are really at it. Slash is really at it. Who knows what Axel's doing, but everyone's really at it. It's a very thick performance. And then that piece tremendously falls down a couple of times into a really mellow performance as well. There's a point where all the where it's pouring with rain and the cake gets knocked over and it just falls to a, I know, a D50 or a wave station or something, this digital pad. It's like, wow. It's, it's not white noise, but it's almost kind of like that. It, it's, it's just a step off silence and everything at once. And then the song comes back in again. Lyrically, it does that a little earlier in the song. I'm just, I can't remember the lines. I love them there. Um, where, where Axel's sort of singing about friends or not really friends. You know, it's that point where a relationship breaks down. That's a tremendous roller coaster of a song. If you don't know it well, go listen to it and pay attention to where things are thick and thin in the several different axes all at once. That's why it's such a stunning piece of work and will be considered a classic over time because you don't write a song like that by accident. Monkeys don't write that kind of stuff. So, tone. We want to really get our head around the idea of tone in our performances. It can be pitch, it can be timbre, all of that at once, and then how we manage that over time. But we can also complexify our tones. Understand that some effects, and this is before, I, and actually, no, I'm not going to talk about wave shapers because I've done wave shapers. Go watch the wave shaper video. If you want to uglify your tone, get a wave shaper, turn it on, turn it up, pretend you're nine inch nails, go for it. But I'm not talking about it here because I've done it. But we can take a very thick, bright, busy tone. Chorus it 
Now, just thinking of tone alone, forgetting the time aspect, which is where it gets all big and wobbly. Just listen to the tone aspect. See if you can pick out what happens. Three, two, one, got the answer. Now I'm hoping that the answer that you've given is when that chorus goes on, the tone actually diminishes. It becomes warmer. It loses brightness. It loses cut. Let me show you. Look at this here. Let's turn our chorus on. Look at this here. So bear in mind, be aware that as you introduce other elements, tone actually becomes very relative. Oh, bloody hell, it sounds like I'm fucking Stein, doesn't it? It is. But again, you don't need to get too far into it, all the maths. The reason that happens is what, in this case, with our chorus, is what's called phase cancellations. It's got a lot going on. These... Partials or overtones get closer together, as you see, closer together, and because they're closer together, then they're more likely to actually be too close to cancel each other out. They do a Star Trek and disappear. So be aware that the other thing about tone is it's relative. Now I've already pointed to that with quite a few of the examples that I've given, like in. Gunners November Rain. Guns and Roses November Rain. There's a lot of relativity in how things compared to each other at that point in time. Contrast is really important in music. Between, remember, silence on one end and the world of everything on the other. Between being thin and thick, dark and light, bright and mellow, all at once, and those things become relative to each other. So if I play that and that, We can't help but compare them to each other. And we're going to go, overall, I've got a tone which has these elements and these elements, but we compare them to each other. And if you think about it cautiously, the way you hear those when they're played together is not quite the same as when they're played apart. That's something you'll probably have to sit with and experiment with yourself, and often it's one that creeps up on you. But when you're mixing or composing, arranging, there will be times where you've got a solo line. Sounds great on its own. You put in something else, and you go, it doesn't sound that good anymore. It may be that your notes are wrong, but generally you know when your notes are wrong because you end up with that kind of stuff, and it's like, oh. So let's assume it's not that. Note-wise, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong harmonically with that at all. So why does that sound quite bold and... And our wonderful bold superb melody line suddenly loses power. It's tone. We've transitioned our tones because they have become relative to one another. That is relative to silence. So therefore, it's the big cat in the room. Understand that, it's really important. Between silence and this, there's a world, therefore it's grand. Between this and this, there's not as much difference anymore. Plus, you've got this, which is a huge sound. Look at it, taking up the whole universe. 
we've already got a sand which is doing its best to be everything and trying to add something on top of it. Tone is relative to what else is happening at the same time. So if we wanted to do that, we would need to do something like this. And that works better. Now, why is that? We've made that sound duller. It's not as grand as it was before. It's lost brightness and thickness and what have you. So is this. But compared to one another, this gives us that base that we're looking for, that grounding. But it's not fighting with this. It's where I've spoken to you before about don't use sands that compete with each other. If we reduce our tone even more, look here. When we were like this, filling up all of this, when we pull this back, I add my next note, look where that's coming in. It's above where most of my lower note is. So tone is always relative to what else is happening in the room. Really, really important concept to get, which is why I know I upset people at the beginning of my bass video because I said that um, what basses and what have you are not basses, they're leads. That's why you can't work with them if you want to have a bigger arrangement, because they're basically doing this, and you're screwed. So in terms of tone, you can do whatever you want. You can compose with nothing but 80 watt basses all playing the whole spectrum at once. Will it be effective? If you're brilliant, yes, it will be. But if you're not yet brilliant enough to know what to do with that and how to manage it, it's an unwise approach to take. So, tone. You've got everything from silence to everything. Anything in between, anywhere in between. It's an elastic scale. But it's more than elastic because something that can sound one way on its own can then sound another way in the other. Because we can turn this example around the other way around. We can be going, oh, doesn't that sound so good? And then we've got this. What happened to my world owning bass sound? Got swallowed by that shit thing happening up there. It's above middle C. I mean, what are you doing? I mean, how uncool are you playing notes up there messing up my bass sound? See, it's relative. Always relative. I know I'm going around and around on that, but I really want people to understand and get this fully. It's easier to, to listen to something, oh, yeah, that's obvious, and then not actually understand it and go and make the very same mistake 10 minutes later. I see my girls do that all the time. You know, they, they go, oh, yeah. Straight off to doing the very thing. So I really want you to, to understand that. That's most of what we've got. Oh, the, the other the other fundamental note, sorry, I should go through. And, and I've largely covered this, but and I've covered it to a fair extent already, but that is tone time means that we are going to be looking at everybody's favourite, which is how tone moves over time. And we'll explore various ways to control that. <laughs> Really take your time to do this on your own keyboard. You don't have to use a, a phase distortion oscillator or whatever. It's just they're very honest. Listen to how tone moves over time. And again, really get to that point where you understand that. 
because you can then start to say if I change the time component I go from let's get rid of that chorus we might even call that a bass sound now we add the chorus especially if we add a delay so we've added more time doubled our time if we're having time and doing it again We've got a paddy sound. Notice that I'm making very small changes here. Let's go to a fast filter envelope attack. Straight away a brass sound. We'll kill our delay. So the only difference here between this and this is time. Change time a little bit again and it's changed again. It's changed again. So time is incredibly important. I know we're all obsessed these days about the timing of the player, you know, that our drummer we've got to go, oh no, he can't play like this, we've got to... I loathe that, because it's not human time anymore. I love drum machines, just love the sound of a drum machine, you know. An 808 or a 606 or a CR78 in a mix, Blondie's Heart of Glass or Visages Fade to Grey, it don't get no better than that. But at the same time, um, hearing Bill Bruford play in Yes, it don't get better than that. Ian Pace playing uh, in early Deep Purple, Chasing Shadows, is just awesome, absolutely awesome. Or Carl Palmer playing in the ELP. There's no metrogenomicness there. So let's not make the mistake of thinking that everything has to be rigid, but understand how small shifts in time give you a different feel. Not only here in terms of the patch, to say that we've moved from a, a quick brass to a slow brass, or a bass sound, but time, because remember time's a big component of this, because time's about space. Time is how we control space. Really complex stuff, but time is how we control space. We whack a clock on the space called our day and say at nine o'clock we go to work. Kind of arbitrary, but nonetheless, it, it, it's necessary and it works. So by making little changes in time, you change the tone of your piece or your day. What if you could say to your boss, hey, look, my tone's not good at nine o'clock in the morning. My tone's a lot better. I'm a lot brighter. I'm a lot, I'm a lot um, faster. I'm a bit too uh, thick and mellow at nine o'clock in the morning. But if you let me come in at ten o'clock, I'm going to be a lot brighter for you. A, a little adjustment of time, we can change the tone of our day. So rather than you turning up nine o'clock and feeling like, <laughs> and being unproductive for an hour which sets you up to be unproductive for a couple more hours if you were to change the timing of your day you turn up at 10 and you're like yeah, ready to rock first thing you sit down with and you're like <laughs> your tone of your day is different so music is exactly the same if we move everything to some predefined time like making everyone turn up at nine o'clock Make your drummer sit perfectly on the, on the beat, the metrogenomic beat. We've destroyed anything resembling groove that was there. The reason that I talk about drummers like Ian Pace and Bill Bruford is because their timing was just gorgeous. Did it fit to some door metronome? No, 
but it didn't want to. They were really playing and working around the piece. So time is part of this, tone's the other part of it. Let all those things work together relatively. If your drummer is on the loose side, but has a beautiful feel, don't ever rearrange it. If your drummer's just shit, rearrange him out of the band and find yourself a proper drummer. Don't go, oh, but it's too hard to find. Yeah, of course they're hard to find, because any band that's any good has gotten them already. But if a drummer turns up and he can play like a drum machine, find another drummer. Because the problem is he has no variation in tone, let alone time. Music and sounds, everything is about things over time. Here's something interesting about the, um, the CZ style oscillator, which I, I actually really, it can be, it can sound wrong, but I kind of adore that it does it. We'll make that a, a fast start. This is normally what you hear. The sound keeps fading out quite evenly. All we're hearing is a time fade. Hear how you've still got the same amount of time on the sound fade, but your tone has faded back to a sign quite quickly. With the possible exception of DX7 type thing, I've never had another sound that does that. I know that's a real aside, but it's a very interesting way of hearing time and tone happening in a way you don't expect it to happen. We're all used to it happening in the beginning, but with the CZ system, it's entirely likely that it's going to happen on the other end as well and be very noticeable. Uh, you can do it with DX7 as well. So I think that basically covers everything that I need to for this time. The future videos as we go through, we're going to be looking at the ways that we alter tone, either statically or over time. So that will include filtering, equalization, and then I hope to actually do a video on mixing using nothing but tone. If somebody's really fast and has a, a reasonably simple piece, I don't mean like a 48-piece a piece orchestra or something like that, you know, the usual four to eight parts, then I'm happy to mix that. So rather than mixing one of my own, I'll mix one of yours. All you have to do is be prepared to put it in the public so people can hear it and let me mix it. If you're interested, please fill this in ASAP, because remember, I work fairly quickly, so I'm not going to sit around for two weeks waiting for something. It's got to be a piece that you want to have mixed. And I'm going to mix using nothing but tone controls. If I don't get anything, no dramas, I use one of my own. Not, not a problem at all. I just think a lot of you will think it's cooler or more interesting if it's something that comes in from outside. I don't really care what genre it is. Remember, I don't care about genre. I prefer it was something that had a bit of a story in it. It doesn't have to be super long, just enough of a piece for we all, for us all to be able to, to learn from. And I'll show you how you can do a full mix using nothing but tone controls. OK, don't forget, special on the um, Indie Musicians Guidebook. It's for only four days. You can go as low as 5 99 if you are fast enough. Or 10 99 if you are a little fast. Or back up to 19.95. Normally it's well and truly worth, worth that. There's a huge amount of information across uh, effectively a whole career, but it's about setting yourself up to have the right mindset. Somebody suggested to me, oh, you're not qualified because you're not famous. Well, you're not qualified to say that to me because you're a rude dick, is my first answer. But my second answer is that 
at no point did I ever actually say that my guidebook will make you famous. If you think that, then you're putting words in my mouth, and that, of course, makes me annoyed, to put it politely. The book's not about that. It's always very clear. It's about the right mindset for potential success. That bit's up to you. It really is up to you. I'm not going to make you famous. No one can make you famous. You can go off with the most famous producers today. And with Dr. Dre were in the room, and I said, Dre, dude, sign me up. And I made a rap record with Dre right now. Put it out tomorrow. Four people might listen to it because it's got Dre's name on it. Would that song be any good? No. It would suck big time if it was you know, me making that record, me rapping. You know, my mother's. It's not going to work. So it's still up to you what you do past that, but the book gives you the right kind of mindset in which to have a chance of building something which will last, because that's the big trick, lasting. You don't want to be a vanilla ice, have like 10 seconds of internet success and then gone. That doesn't benefit anyone, least of all you. So the book, please, if you find this stuff interesting, subscribe. Also, positive feedback goes an awful long way. Not as far as giving me money, honestly because my kids don't eat air. Thank you.